Can you guys hear me out there? <laughs> but we have to do we have to do a toast tonight because it's the Detroit Drunken Historical Society. So get your glasses. And as we start every Detroit Drunken Historical Society event, we say the Detroit motto. We hope for better things that will rise from the ashes. So let's say that now. We hope for better things it will rise from the ashes. I'm sorry for shouting those people in the back of that. Um, <laughs> so finally, what you can't remind you, you can't come to hear us speak. You probably didn't come here to eat and drink, but I hope you do. And please, please be good to your servers. Be good to the Dakota Inn. Be great to Carl and his family here. They've let us come in here and take over. So keep buying more booze. Keep buying more food, please. I'll announce the winner of the trivia contest after the talk. But uh, now i got to introduce our speakers. To your right is Mr. John W. Stroh the third. John has been the chair. Yes. <laughs> John has been the chairman and chief executive officer of the Stroh Companies Incorporated since May 1999. He's been a member of the board of directors of the Stroh Companies and its subsidiary, SBC Holdings Incorporated, formerly Stroh Brewing Company, since 1989. Mr. Stroh is a founding director of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy and also serves as the director of the D Detroit Downtown Partnership and the Metropolitan Affairs Coalition, and he's an emeritus director of the DIA. to be outdone is sitting next to Mr. Jim, James W. Totus, I call him Jim, Mr. Jim Totus. Mr. Jim Totus, formerly a curator in the Department of American Art at the Detroit Institute of Arts, is, yeah, oh. <laughs> he's currently the director of collections, uh, director of collections at the Museum in the City of New York. Oh, good, yeah. uh, and he's also the author of the Guardian Building book, which you saw here below. And he's also a uh, scholar of different subjects related to American art. Um, give it up for Mr. Jim Toda. Thank you. So this is going to just be a conversation between these two, and I'm going to let them take it away. Good luck, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Say, can I... Um, can I get an I'm prosit from this group? Yes. Maybe we'll open with one. I'm just, I'm, I was really quite delighted and surprised to have been asked to come speak to the Detroit Drunken Historical Society, and I had the opportunity to tell a couple of people that I had been so invited, and, and I described the organization, and I got this jaundiced look, like, what? And, and uh, but when I heard it was at the Dakota Inn, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have missed it for a moment, and uh, when my good friend Jim Totus uh, offered to uh, participate. Uh, that was the, that closed the deal. And I have to say, I've loved the Dakota Inn ever since I was a child. The, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the mo one of these great Detroit traditions that we have, and they've been here forever, which is a wonderful thing, providing joy and happiness to Detroiters. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Well, I thought, Jim, Jim and I are going to, you know, we have some different <clears throat> uh, strengths in our, in our respective backgrounds. And um, I was going to talk about the, uh, uh, the brewing industry and history of the brewing industry in Detroit. Um, I have to tell you, I was set a little ill at ease when I walked in the door and saw so many of my friends in the uh, collecting community who probably know more about this than I do 
and I'm, I'm a little worried about being called out, but I'm going I'm to do my best. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best if, uh, to, to uh, uh, limit the errors or, or be uh, substantially correct uh, uh, where, wherever possible. But um, I think, let me, if I could just launch this with uh, Detroit is, of course, like every city in America, a city of immigrants. The brewing industry is. Uh, largely an industry of northern peoples, uh, the, the people who lived in, in, in grain-producing lands. People who lived in grape-producing lands uh, had a much easier time making wine. Uh, and, uh, but, but Detroit, uh, being in, in the northern lands itself and then settled by so many northern Europeans, uh, really developed a, a terrific brewing culture would have started with the French. Uh, the French most assuredly would not have come here without the capacity to brew beer. Uh, beer is brewed wherever grain is grown, and grain would have been grown here. So the, uh, the French would have been brewing on a very small scale in inns uh, in Detroit when the fort had 50 or 100 people. They probably four didn't streets. import much. Hmm? Four streets. Yeah. Four yeah. streets. Yeah. That's all. That, there were only four streets in the Fort of Detroit, four, or Fort Pontchartrain. Um, there were only four streets. How so. many people? Well, it started off with 50. And then they grew, but, you know, during, during the first, you know, 50 years, there were not many. You know, I doubt if they had more than 500 people right. by the time the Brits took over in uh, 1760. Well, we, we can't identify any commercial breweries from the French period. The, uh, the earliest commercial breweries uh, become evident in the early 18th, or early 19th century, kind of 1820s, 1830s. Uh, so this is after the War of 1812. Which after when did, when did the British relinquish? Or when did the British relinquish Detroit to to? Uh, the British relinquished Detroit in the 1890s, and then no, they took it back. <clears throat> 1790s. 1790s, yes. Yeah. In the 1790s. Excuse me. They, they relinquished it in 1794, actually. Have another beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the British, they, they relinquished the city in 1794. Yeah. And then they take it back in 1811, and they leave in 1813. 1813, okay. And, you know... <clears throat> When we begin to see some of the early British-inspired breweries, it has to do with at post-statehood, which is 1834. Okay, uh, 37. 37. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back. This is, we have a little back and forth here. <clears throat> Let's check uh, the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so the British the British type breweries were mostly. Were, were ales. They were all ales, and and frankly, all beer, uh, you know, for thousands of years, were were what what we would today define as ales, and and an, an ale is ferment. An ale is a beer that is made with with grain that is uh, you know a, a con you know, the the starch of, of which is converted uh, with the enzymes in uh, malt, uh, and then it is mashed, mixed with warm water, hot water, to, to activate those enzymes to convert the starch to sugar, and then they strain the liquid off and put yeast in it, uh, and the yeast eat the sugar. And as my beer school professor said, the, uh, the yeast uh, 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 tinkle alcohol and, 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 and poop CO2. <laughs> and, and so the... They, so all the beers that were made up until the early 18th or early 19th century would have would have been ales. They were fermented with top fermenting yeast. That would be a yeast that ferments at a high temperature, and and uh, you know creates a lot of foam and bubbles in the yeast. Rise to the top once they are finished so John, fermenting the, uh, the the sugar. Much like yogurt, beer is a very healthy thing that helps balance the bacteria in the intestinal system, and therefore is very good for you. Yeah, but it works for me. Yeah, yeah. So the key, the key element that the, that <clears throat> the next step 
in the, in the brewing industry in Detroit was the arrival of the Germans. And basically, most good things that happened in America can really be traced back to the arrival of the Germans. <laughs> the, the, Germans the Germans were a, a refugee group that were different from most of the other refugee groups that came to America all through the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. The Germans were not economic refugees. They were political refugees. And the Germans were fleeing the revolution of 1848, where they were looking for a, 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 a change in the government in the former Holy Roman Empire, which had disintegrated. Uh, and, and they were looking, they were very nationalistic, very proud to be Germans, and they were members of, I don't know, was it 50 or, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 little principalities, right. a whole bunch. Uh, the, 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 the revolution failed, the Prussians won, the revolution failed, and the people who left tended to be the educated, uh, I would call them at the risk of sounding too red, the bourgeoisie class. Uh, and, and so they came to, they went all over the world, and basically wherever they went, they brought with them the brewing technology that they knew in Germany. And they came to America in the eight, late 1840s, both my sets of my great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, came here at that time, along with the great waves of Germans that started all the major breweries in the United States, the Bushes, the Paps, the Millers, the Schlitz family, Joseph Schlitz, and the Eline family, who were his heirs. And they brought with them a technology that had developed quite recently, uh, quite recently before their departure, which was the fermentation and, uh, of, 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 of beer using what is called a lager yeast that sinks to the bottom. Uh, and, and that product, uh, because it sinks to the bottom, you need to draw the liquid off the top instead of, you know, to get to the yeast to recrop it in the next brew, and, and that beer was then moved into a different tank, and it was, they, they, they found that it got better the longer you left it in that tank, so they stored it. German, lager is a German word for storage. So Pilsener beer, the Pilsener style beer that, that developed in the Sudeten, Sudeten German territory that became Czechoslovakia, uh, became the dominant beer style globally within a very, very, very short time. Of, of the German uh, emigration, emigration, yeah, in, in the within, 1840s. Was, within, within less than 20 years, uh, the British breweries, or the British style breweries, the ones that were making ale in this city, had disappeared. And I think as it's pointed out in the, in the book, by the 1880s, there were only two left. Uh, because the new style of beer that, was, that came with the Germans was so much more appreciated. It was a different type of brewing, it was uh, a clearer type of ale, and it really leads to what we think of today as American beer. Uh, and the great brewing families <coughs> made these, which brings us up to the 1893 World's Fair. Where it all came, well, let me, yeah, where, where, where it all came together, kind of. Yes. Well, that was, uh, you could describe that. I, I'm not sure I know the importance of that. The, the World's Columbian Exposition, which was the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, was America's second greatest World's Fair. The, the first was when America announced to the world that it was a regular country, it was not just a mere colony, and that was the centennial that was done in 1876 in Philadelphia. Some years later, Chicago does the Great World's Fair. It is, the city is called the White City. The leading architects in the country designed the buildings. McKinney and White are there. Uh, Daniel Burnham, who is responsible for three of downtown Detroit standing uh, skyscrapers, the Dime Ford and uh, Whitney buildings, was the master planner for the World's Fair. Uh, they brought in great artists from all over the country, uh, and as well as European artists. Uh, it was completely electrified which was a very new technology. So at night, it was all illuminated. So this was a really significant turning point in the art and architecture of America. But it was also a moment that where you had other great uh, achievements. And one of the most important achievements was for Detroit that the Stroh Brewing Company won the gold medal 
for the best beer at the World's Fair of 1893. Now, so, so, so Jim, Jim was at the office today, and we rooted through the archives, and I dug up the medal, which sat, which was in my grandfather's desk, uh, and his father's desk before him. Uh, but you know, in, in our our family, uh, back up just a touch, the great great grandfather Bernard showed up in 1850, and he and, but he and he had money, you know, which is typical of the Germans that came. He had 150 bucks, which uh, <laughs> which which uh, might buy you dinner here for a, a small table, but 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 then it was it. It would it would it would buy you a lot and and so he got started and uh, he died in 1882 uh, a few years after completing a big brewery on Gratiot, um, which made him the biggest brewer in Michigan. So it was in 1893, with his sons having taken over the business, that they they entered their beer in the uh, World's Fair. I noticed a lot of breweries win these awards at World's Fairs, but at any rate, we won the gold medal and I. It's the most important fair. Uh, indeed, and I showed Jim. The, the Augustus St. Gaudens Medal uh, of, of, uh, of our, uh, our, our award in the World's Fair. And that it stayed on our label, uh, that, that award, I think into the 80s probably, although Joe Olson would know that exactly <clears throat> when, uh, when that, was, well, that was taken off. But it was over 100 years. And, and it was a huge event. For those of you who don't know who Augustus St. Gaudens was, he was the leading sculptor of his day. If you'd like to see examples of his work, visit the American Wing at the DIA. There are several on view. Uh, and so to have this medal and this award was enormously prestigious. And, I'm and about it. to you know, really put things into perspective, winning a gold medal or being acknowledged at the World's Fair of 1893 was not one of the run-of-the-mill affairs. This was also wedged between the two most important <coughs> Parisian world's fairs of, 18, of the 19th century, of, 1899, of 1889 and 1900. 1889 being the one where the Eiffel Tower goes up. Um, so what's, what's going on here in Detroit, and we're going to get to uh, some of the, you know, the growth of the breweries here. Um, and I, ha I learned only today, talking to Jim, about some of the, you know, the architectural significance. Jim is an architectural historian. Uh, it writes extensively on, on architecture and uh, brewing architecture. Uh, for those of us who collect, uh, brewing history is, uh, is, is pretty unique. And it's, I've always been able to tell my kids and anybody I was with in a car or driving through a city, that was a brewery. And you can, you can spot them a mile off. They all look like breweries. Uh, and, brew, and the brew architecture was used. It's called <laughs> Romanesque Revival Architecture. It was pioneered by a guy named H.H. Uh, Richardson. And these buildings basically have big, heavy, rounded arches, uh, rough cut stone, <clears throat> and they look like castles. Think about turrets. Think about uh, you know, sort of a cutout at the top. And they were, they were intended by the brewers to be very attractive parts of the landscape. So it isn't supposed to just be your average industrial building. Breweries, by their very nature, were big establishments with very tall towers for the brew house. And so you needed this, so it makes a real impact. And in the days before skyscrapers, this rivaled the turrets of churches that you would see on the, on the skyline. It's interesting how attractive breweries were. One of them, at least one, if not more, are now museums. I know uh, in San Antonio, Texas, the art museum is based in a former brewery. Yeah, the old that that was the original Anheuser Busch. Uh, Anheuser Busch had a branch there, the San Antonio Brewing Company, which which became uh, became the art museum. But in in Detroit, uh, you had in the eighteen. 50s, you had the Germans getting established, the, the beer style becoming dominant, uh, the beer style being modified slightly uh, from the German style, which would have been governed by the Reinheitsgebot, the, the, the German purity law that required the use of 100%, of, uh, you know, malt, yeast, hops, and water, the four ingredients. And the, in, in America, uh, they had slightly different varieties of barley. Uh, with, with, uh, and I don't want to get very scientific here, but but they, you know they had slightly more what they called diastatic power. They had more enzyme enzyme activity that that allowed them to convert the sugar, uh, the starch in grain uh, into fermentable sugar. So what Americans did was they they started using uh, 
uh, other grains as adjuncts. Now, the Germans all over the world used other grains wherever they went as adjuncts. In Africa and China, they used millet. Um, in America, oops, see, sorry. In, in America, they started using, um, they started using um, uh, corn, uh, first rice and then, and then later corn. So the American beer style, I'm jumping 100 years ahead, but the American beer style that, that, that we are accustomed to today, and we'll speak about micros in a minute, is that, that light uh, uh, malt adjunct beer uh, that in the 60s uh, and the 70s you would have um, recognized, you would have recognized um, as basically all the, all the American beer, you know, Schaefer, Schlitz, Pabst, Budweiser, Strohs, everybody, you know, was essentially the same, the same analytical profile, 11 gravity, um, 12 or 14 or 15 BUs, bitterness units for the home brewers who would know what, the, the, know what that is. Uh, and and there, was a, there was kind of a certain sameness that evolved in American beer, not unlike the sameness that you see in German beer, uh, <clears throat> although there can be some variation regionally. Uh, and and it, was, it was that that, uh, that, that, that really set off the, uh, the home brewing and the, and the, and the micro brewing movement. But let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to duck back into the, uh, the 1890s with the expansion of the Detroit breweries where you wound up with, what, was, what did the book say? How many, were, how many breweries in the 1890s? Was it 30 or 40? It was a, it's, it's an, an enormous number. number. And, and these are big <laughs> establishments with very large plants. Uh, these were not small breweries that we think of today. Uh, you know, and when you think of what they grow into in the pre and then definitely post prohibition era, they're enormous plants. And what you and, and the reason that you had so many was that beer didn't travel very well. Uh, beer was a product that was best consumed locally, uh, and it was really Anheuser Busch and Schlitz and to some extent Pabst who sort of developed this great. Uh, uh, method of, you know, using refrigerated boxcars to move beer around. So they would, they, you know, it was Louis Pasteur who experimented with pasteurization in the 1870s. And that was really the, the key breakthrough that allowed beer to be packaged and shipped any distance. Uh, it, there, was, there was enough yeast and bacteria carryover from the storage tanks that could, at room temperature, uh, ignite spoilage. Uh, an important thing about beer is that, that Beer can't ever hurt you because human pathogens can't grow in it. Uh, it, it the pH is too low. So one of the reasons that, that uh, and Jim knows this story far better than I, but you know, America was a besotted country in yes. the 18th century because you couldn't drink the water. God knows you wouldn't drink the milk. Uh, and, and the only thing that was safe was, was beer, beverages. cider, distilled beverages, water mixed with, and the kids drank it, everybody drank it, because you'd be poisoned if you drank the water. Literally, people would drop dead from drinking water. Before the purification of water, which doesn't really happen until the 1890s, you do not have safe, clean drinking water. So it was customary for kids to drink beer as part of their natural consumption. The other thing is, unless you lived in a city or somewhat of an urban area, you couldn't have beer in the 19th century because it just didn't travel. They had to be in concentrated urban areas. You could have other liquors and ciders, and that was more of a country beverage. And certainly, when you would drink water, it had to be boiled. Uh, the taste was putrid. That's why you have things like lemonade, and you'd put lemons in it to change it. And I think any of us who are whose hair is the same color as mine remember going north of Birmingham and tasting the most god awful things coming out of taps. Uh, and it's you know why people turn to beer uh, as something that would quench a beverage, a quench, quench a thirst. It was some, a beverage that was thought that would give people some sort of vim and vigor. Made for a better work day. Works for me. <laughs> well, I think it works for all of us, too. <laughs> but there was a real practical sense. Literally, the temperance movement does not even begin to gain any momentum, the horrors that they were, until the 1820s when you get the uh, Croton Aqueduct going into New York, bringing fresh water. The more the water becomes palatable and drinkable, the more the temperance unions begin to grow and begin to look at any sort of 
spirited beverage as being a taboo bad thing. You know, my maternal grandfather never trusted water. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you he, know what uh, yeah. W.C. Field said and, about water. Yeah, and it didn't end well for him either. But, but, <laughs> but at, any, at, any, at any rate. Um, but, but so what, what happened in Detroit is you get this great evolution of these, these, these great breweries like Voigt and, and, uh, and Kling and Stroh and, and Tivoli, Pfeiffer, uh, uh, E&B, Detroit Brewing Company. E&B and Detroit Brewing Company are still standing uh, in the eastern market. Um, most of the Germans settled in that area, so you had a really big concentration of breweries there. Uh, you had the, uh, as the brewing industry, and just to give you an idea of the skepticism people had for the traction that prohibition could gain, there was a tremendous amount of investment in the 1890s, 1910s, 1900s, and 1910s in the brewing industry, and the, the British bought into the industry. Uh, my great grandfather built a brand new brewery and finished it in 1914. I mean, and spent uh, well over a million dollars building it back when a million dollars was real money. And 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 he 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 built he built uh, you know the brewery that, that most of you remember on Gratiot Avenue. Finished the brew house in uh, 1914. Uh, just four years before Prohibition started in Michigan. That is not somebody who thought there was any possibility that Prohibition could pass. And what he didn't count on. <laughs> well, and in 1914, the brew house was one of the tallest structures in the city. It was also something that was exceedingly modernist and looked forward to the future. There was no uh, any sort of applied decoration. It was very plain, very austere. This is something we don't see in architecture until well after the 1930s. So it anticipates what we would call the international style from a design standpoint. But also in the brew house were these elaborate rooms that were decorated, tile floors, painted ceilings, copper kettles, polished. It was all part of an aesthetic that was consciously produced by the brewers. This doesn't only stop with the architecture. It actually continues through the marketing in a way that other companies, <laughs> other industries do not embrace using artists and design. And the beer industry was one of the leaders of this, especially when it comes to uh, bringing in illustrators and the design of labels. You know, I brought my label collection, but the darn place is so full that there's just no way that I can lay it out. I figured, you know, I figured there'd be 20 people here and we could just set it up on the table. And, and, but I, ha I have a collection Probably, probably the biggest collection of pre-1950 Michigan labels anywhere, and, it, and it's a, um, uh, it, you know, they go from yeah, probably the earliest ones, maybe the 1880s, and then uh, up, up, up to, well, 1950, when there was a certain government mandatory uh, regarding tax payment uh, 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 verbiage that was taken off the labels, and a lot of collectors sort of picked that as the, as the end point for their, for their, uh, for their collecting, but so that if at some point if the crowd thins out and there's an opportunity to open it up, I'd love to have people take a look at it. The the um, so the, the the brewing business comes racing up uh, in Michigan, in Detroit, in into the uh, early 20th century. The auto business uh, is taking hold. Uh, there is are huge waves of immigrants coming into Detroit. Uh, from Europe, from the South, and, 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 and really all over the country and all over the world. Uh, and, but, but most of them are coming from Northern Europe, uh, and they're coming from beer cultures, and, and the business just explodes. And of course, exploding with it is Anglo-Protestant xenophobia. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the Anglo-Protestants, and I'm half Anglo-Protestant, uh, uh, well, half Anglo and all Protestant, but, 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 but uh, the, it was the Anglo-Protestant power elite that, that really got behind, particularly the Methodists. Uh, They're got, the worst. Yeah. 
<laughs> that got behind prohibition and started pushing it, and they incremented away, starting you know really seriously in the 1880s and 90s, but incremented away and started electing Congress people. Well, started electing dog catchers, started electing council people, uh, started you know uh, drain commissioners, and then finally you know uh, uh, congressmen and senators until they began to to really get some traction. So the it. But what really put prohibition over the finish line was, you know, the failure of the uh, the Nicky Willie letters in the summer of uh, 1914 uh, that that ultimately culminated in in the in 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 uh, August uh, Germany marching uh, through Belgium uh, in a in a most brutal way on their way to Paris. Uh, to give the French their perceived just desserts. And, and the, that war uh, uh, obviously slogged on uh, way too long and was one of the great horrible events in world history. Uh, but what it did was it turned public opinion in America against the, against the Germans. And the Germans were really represented by the brewers, and they, the the Germans, you know, at, at, you know, who who were our engineers, our architects, our bankers, uh, our professional class that you know dominated the professional classes in America and still do. I mean, thirty percent of Americans are of German descent, or thirty-five percent, some huge number, um, and and uh, so the the prohibition was finally pushed over the finish line. It was a, there was a great sinister cabal of interests that came together to do this. It was the, you know, women wanting to vote. Can, can you believe Women's that? And, oh, yeah. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then John Vivian's in the room. And Just then, temper that. And then, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a tomato on the forehead. Uh, and then, uh, and then, and then the, um, uh, and then the other, the other thing that was going on was you had the progressive movement, the labor movement that was angling for wealth redistribution and income taxes. Well, you know, there was no income tax in this country uh, until 1913. And, and that legislation was pushed in a sort of a coalition, but really led by the Anti-Saloon League and the Prohibitionist Movement because how did the US pay for its government? Through the tax on alcohol and spirits. And, and the only way you could push prohibition over the finish line was to create uh, another source of revenue from the government. So that it's in comes the Internal Revenue Act, and I still have our tax returns on file with the, that, that were filed by my great-grandfather under protest with a letter from his lawyer saying, we don't think this is constitutional, and we're paying this under protest for the first three or four years, and then prohibition came, and he finally started to you know, save the legal bills and skip the letter. But uh, the war started and taxes started to go up. But at any rate, so prohibition hits. All the breweries eventually close except Strokes. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they all decided that, you know, that, well, all of them looked for ways to use their physical plant to make money. Uh, and, uh, you know, so they got into the soda pop business. They got into the, you warehouses. know, we got into the ice cream business, warehouses, cold storage. Uh, but we also made near beer. Now, near beer, who, you know, who's ever had it, uh, non-alcoholic beer, used to be, it's although, actually, Bitburger Drive is pretty good, but, but, but it's generally a pretty heinous product. And, and, the, the, and especially, especially in the Dark Ages, you know, in, it, it, you know you, the, the, you, the, the way you get alcohol out of beer is to heat it up. Well, you know, one of the great enemies of beer, once it's beer, is is heat uh, and and it really spoils the flavor. So you would you know you they they you'd make beer and then you'd run it through a dealkoholizer which basically boils it. You'd use vacuum distillation so you could lower the the boiling point so it wouldn't harm it. The heat wouldn't harm it quite as much. But near beer, in, if you see the labels in my collection, they they invariably say serve very cold <laughs> and. You, you, you'll still see that. I mean, if you looked at a can of O'Doul's, it would say, serve cold. <laughs> and so, and there's a reason for that. Uh, but the, um, ultimately what happened was all the businesses in Detroit, all the breweries in Detroit, got out of the near beer business by the end of the 20s. And lo and behold, Stroh is the only one 
making near beer. And so as the ill wind of prohibition began to lighten up and there was a sense that it might eventually uh, uh, go away after 15 years, we had a cellar full of beer. So come April, uh, actually it was May 10th, I think, 1933, Three. we shipped the first barrel of beer. And it was, it was and we had, I think, a, a monopoly for probably the entire summer. And all, and all of our Milwaukee friends also were brewing, so they had, you know, they perhaps got a foothold here. But, but there's, that, there's the famous photograph of your grandfather serving Fred Alger, the first beer on Victory Day, yeah. when yeah. people are allowed to drink again. But we need to back up a little bit, because in talking about prohibition, you have to keep in mind that there was a big debate whether wine would be included or not, because of the very, the very group that John was talking about did not want to give up wine. And so they looked around ways to give it up. And you needed wine, certainly for religious ceremonies. So, you had, so the California wineries could make wine uh, that was produced. And if you were of a certain religious affiliation and wine was part of your ritual, you or could have it. Or cultural heritage. Or cultural heritage, you could have it. Home wine was fine. Home breweries were fine. And that was because the Italians we're on the right side of World War I. <laughs> and, and the Germans were on the wrong side. So, 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 so beer, making beer at home was strictly illegal, but making wine at home was okay. So, so you, you'll remember, uh, those of you old enough to remember the 70s, when you know, they'd have these, you know, when there, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Loggins was, uh, was selling guitar lessons by by, by phone and, and and other folks were were selling were selling um, homemade wine kits and I asked my dad why can't we make beer at home and he said well because it's illegal but, well how come wine's legal he said I don't know it's complicated <laughs> but it was all because the Italians were on the right side in World War One and they weren't punished like the Germans were um, and yes. but anyway. So. Before we get into the dreaded Volstead Act and the torture that it created for so many of our ancestors, uh, there are some things we have to think about beer prior, uh, prior to Prohibition. Uh, beer was a different product, well, it was a different product, number one, and John's going to talk about that in a minute, because we're going to force him to tell us what the 1893 beer really tastes like. But beer was also served in a much different manner. Uh, you just couldn't go to a tavern uh, and buy any number of beers that you wanted. They were pretty much tithed to one brewery. And many of the, and many of the taverns or distribution houses, if you would, were owned by breweries. So it was a much more controlled environment. Well, and, and you know, when you see that sign that says beer five cents, well, it wasn't a glass like this. It was, it was, it was, it was a shell. It was a little glass, uh, but so so actually the brewers did control the saloons, and it's by the way it's this way in most of the world. Uh, the uh, one one of the causes of prohibition again was this perception that you know the these they, the, the saloons had become these these iniquitous dens of of filth and and drunkenness that that were. That were that were filled with oh my god that's a Schweinhoxen. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't see that on the menu. That that that, that, that the, the the saloons were these 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 filthy dirty places filled with swarthy immigrants smoking cigars and getting drunk and spending their children's milk money on on, on on beer and and rent money and and uh, and and so and that the, perception ties into the early advertisements the advertisements of the 1880s 90s the first decade of the 20th century oftentimes brew uh, breweries use uh, kids as part of the advertisement program uh, a family product <laughs> a family that drinks together stays together <laughs> For, and, for home use. <laughs> and so you had these magnificent illustrations of these young kids. Your family had a, a little kid. Where's the, Mu the Munich child. Yeah. In a, in a red cloak, running around, delivering beer, 
Christopher, couldn't, Christopher couldn't find his red cloak oh. today. <laughs> but, so they, it was a launching pad for the dry crowd to say, this is exploitation of children. And that, you know, alcohol and beer specifically was bad for kids. When indeed it had been very much a part of everyday life. Keeping in mind that really chlorinated water did not come around until the 1890s. So this is a very new, new idea that people shouldn't be drinking yeah, beer on a regular they, basis. They just didn't get it. They didn't but, get it. No, it's still like, don't get it. Yeah. So, so the, actually, there was a there was a, a reference to the flavor profile of the beer that um, that would have been uh, enjoyed in the 1890s. And again, because the raw materials were different, remember beer beer is made of agricultural raw materials. There's different there are differences crop year to crop year. Evolution of, of seed and, and seed varieties and so forth. So the beer that, I mean, Jim Cook tried very hard to, to create the beer that uh, you know, became Boston Lager to kind of fit the profile of a beer that would have been brewed in the 1880s, 1890s. And, and, and he had to really use quite heroic measures to do it because the, the raw materials just don't permit it. Uh, the, the, uh, that would have been a, gra a beer for the home brewers uh, with a 13, 13 and a half original gravity and an alcohol content under 5%. Well, you can't do that today because the, the, uh, the, the enzyme content of, of the malt is so, the, the malted barley is, is so uh, high that you get a, 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 a tremendous conversion of all the starch into fermentable sugars and you, you would wind up with a malt liquor if you started with a 13 gravity like, oh, say, St. Ives. And I can sing some of the songs, but I'll bet they won't be as popular as I'm prosing. <laughs> I, I can render an Ice Cube version of, uh, of, of the St. Ives song. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> well. Part, part of what's going on in pre-prohibition is also the brewers, especially the larger brewers, are beginning to employ some of the best illustrators in the country to come up with these great illustrative schemes. They're not only on labels, and we're using lithography, which is a new, relatively new process at this point, but they're in posters, they're on trays, they're on mirrors. They begin to use attractive women thinking of the Gibson girl transformed to serving a Stroh's beer, for lack of another product. But it wasn't just one company. They were all doing it. And it's something that's very different than other industries. If you think about wine bottles or liquor bottles, the labels were very plain. Hiram Walker was the first to put his name and the name of Canadian Club on a bottle. Before that, it was just whiskey. So when you start looking at what's happening with the brewers of this time and the, quite honestly, the very decorative labels, there was this idea of aesthetics that goes hand in hand with the brewing industry. And certainly, some of the imagery that they used helped fuel the fires of the dry crowd. So I, I just looked at my watch and in horror saw that I was 50 minutes into my 30 minute talk. <laughs> so, which, 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 <laughs> so, so what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, if I could, I'm going to get us past prohibition and kind of, <laughs> and, 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 and sort of glide into something that some of us might remember. Uh, and uh, so, so prohibition ends, uh, a number of breweries reactivate, mostly under new ownership. The Global Brewery was under new ownership. Pfeiffer was under new ownership. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, so I think we wound up with you know probably what 12 or 14 breweries, all in probably not all at the same time after prohibition. You know you have old uh, Dutch. Old what was the old Holland? Old Holland. Uh, you had old Holland. You had uh, Voigt reactivated and merged with with uh, uh, Prost Vons. That's another one. Uh, what was it? Regal. Regal. Oh yes. Yeah, that was like a two-year wonder. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and then in addition to Stroh, Pfeiffer, Goebel, E and B, Detroit Brewing Company, uh, and Schmidt, um, American came in. Zinda. Zinda. Yes. Frank. Thank you. Uh, and and so, so these these breweries uh, operated. You know. 
in the 30s, there were a bunch of, you know, it was a great, everybody thought beer was going to be the next big thing, so everybody dusted off their wallets and, and invested in the beer business. Well, you know, it, it turned out it was a pretty rough and tumble industry, and, and people got squeezed out pretty, pretty fast. So a lot of those guys failed. And so we, we, we run into the, uh, the period by 1958, there are five breweries left in Detroit. It's, it's, uh, it's Schmidt, Goebel, e &B, uh Pfeiffer, and Stroh. And uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, Altus, Altus, excuse me, six. So there's a strike in 1958. The brewery workers decide that they're gonna, they want to be paid like auto workers, and 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 they, you know, they're, they're, and my grandfather said, no, 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 we can't do that. And there was a strike, and it was, a, and of course, it was in May, April, May. There was a, it was a five-week strike, and the uh, all the breweries were shut down. The the union called up their friends in Milwaukee and said, send the beer and let's put let's pile the pressure on these guys. Well, by and by, the strike ends in July. It takes what I don't know another two months before you get any beer on the shelf, and all of a sudden, the market share of the Detroit brewers goes down 60 percent. Uh, Schmidt, e &B close almost immediately. Uh, Pfeiffer's hobbled, Goebbels hobbled. Uh, Stroh went from, I think, 10th nationwide down to 15th. Uh, uh, three and a half million barrels of volume down to 1.6. Uh, and, and we didn't get back to three and a half million barrels until the late 60s. So it took almost 10 years to get the volume back. Meanwhile, you've got Anheuser-Busch, Schlitz, Miller, and, and uh, 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 growing in the South and in the West. So we were, we were growing, but losing market share uh, nationwide. Uh, we bought Goebel out of bankruptcy in 1980, uh, 1964, excuse John, me. but you should talk about just one quick thing, the advent of Goebel because of the ownership and their relationship with the Lions, which pushed you into the relationship with the Tigers. You better tell me about that. Okay. Be because of the common ownership between Goble Beer and the Detroit Lions, Goble Beer becomes the beer served at Lions events. Stroh's picks up on this. They cannot get into the football arena, so to speak, but very much go into the baseball and then become and hockey as well and moves in, but it's first baseball, then hockey, and they become the leading beer supplier for baseball events, and then moving on to hockey like you mentioned. And that was because of Andy Anderson, who was running Goebel at the time, and he owned the Lions in a consortium that then Bill Ford bought into, and as Goebel, and, uh, Goebel blew apart, Andy Anderson blew apart, I think the Haas family and the Moon family also owned Goebel, but Goebel began to falter. They had, they bought a brewery out west and thought they could uh, they could sell global beer in California, and it was a tough. You know, a lot of breweries did that. They Altus bought one and two in uh, San Diego. Rheingold from New York bought um, Acme in California, which was the dominant brewer in California, and they literally bought it, turned off Acme beer, and and turned on Rheingold, which nobody knew about, and nobody wanted, and the damn thing just went out of business. Uh, so, so in comes Anheuser Busch, Schlitz, and Miller, and they just and Coors, and they just take over in in uh, in the West Coast and just become more and more dominant. Uh, so by and by come the uh, uh, the seventies, uh, where you know the baby boom is kind of tailing off, the growth in the beer business is uh, slackening, and Stroh winds up really backed into a corner and 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 needing to do something. So that was when cousin Peter reached out, bought Schaefer. Uh, in New York uh, to get some a foothold in the East. Of course, the East wasn't a growth market. What we really needed was a foothold in the West. Yes. Uh, and uh, and the very next year, Schlitz came up for sale. It's a pretty complicated chain of events here, which I'm going to skip. But essentially, we bought Schlitz 1982 um, uh, and and went from I don't know after we bought Schaefer, we might have been sixth, seventh uh, nationwide. And then we became third after we bought Schlitz. Meanwhile, you know, the Schlitz brand and Old Milwaukee were declining like crazy. They kept dec declining like crazy. We rolled Stroh's out nationwide in 1983, 84, um, and actually got a little toehold for a while before 
uh, you know, we eventually just were, we, you know, didn't have the critical mass to uh, to manage the the national marketing effort that uh, that that you needed to play in that sandbox, and uh, and you know, to make a short story long, we we uh, uh, we we eventually uh, uh, we elected to sell the business in 1999, and that sort of ended the the you know the big commercial brewing history of Detroit. Although you know the plant had closed in 86, 85, as you recall. Uh, the microbrewing business began to catch hold in America in the late 70s as people began to, to become tired of the typical American style beer. And, and, and people discovered ales and they discovered that it was actually really easy to make. It's very hard to make a pilsner, but it's really easy to make an ale. And you can do it on your stovetop uh, and, and uh, in, your, you know, in your garage, your basement. Uh, and and so the, so a lot of people got very excited about home brewing and then micro brewing and of course because prohibition so proscribed the ability uh, to get licenses to make beer it was very difficult Michigan finally I want to say in 1987 or 88 uh, changed the law so that you could have pub breweries and micro breweries and 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 it just took off. Uh, and there are a tremendous number of very interesting producers. My friends across the street at Atwater make some, that was, by the way, built as a Pilsner brewery, built by Germans. Uh, and and they, they make very, very serviceable Pilsner. I think one of the few small brewery Pilsners that you can get that's worth drinking. Uh, and I don't mean that that's kind of a blanket statement. It's just a very hard style to make. Uh, and the popular micro beers uh, uh, almost invariably are pale ales, India pale ales, uh, imperial stouts, and it's, it seems to be a trend toward darker and more bitter uh, because, you know, the lighter and less bitter you get, the more like the stuff you didn't like you become. Which is so. all very much part of a fashion, too. When you think about the way beer has been marketed, the way it's been bottled, it's changed, and John will, can talk about, you know, the capping machine and how that changes the distribution of beer and brings it much wider, but what you see is an advent of the beer going from the long necks to the cans to the short bottles, and then with sort of vintage beers that were not necessarily particularly successful or popular beers, such as Corona and, um, uh, no, 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 no um, the one from New York, the uh, green bottle, uh, long neck green bottle. Uh, oh, Rolling Rock. Rolling Rock. Yeah. Rolling Rock. Yeah. Yeah. That, Pennsylvania, yeah. yeah now Pennsylvania, Newark. Right. Now it's made by Anheuser Busch in Newark. But these become. This is what helps launch back the long necks. Yeah, yeah. The 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 bar the bar packages that people you know they're easier to handle. You can show people what you're drinking because what you drink is what you are. You know, it's like. Uh, but but I think this is probably a decent time to to wrap it up. And I think you know Gabe had envisioned. Um, that there would be 30 minutes of talking. I'm now an hour into that, and and that uh, and that there would be some questions. So I don't know if anybody has any, but I'd be happy, or Jim would be happy to give a, give it a shot. Yes. I don't have, I don't have a question, but there was a slogan that was used back when you're talking about malt that was on a tray for that scrolls. Was used for weak people and nourishing mothers. Nursing mothers. Nursing mothers. <laughs> yes. Well, I thought you were going to maybe touch on that. that, that well, that, you that, still. That, that was that health drink for, my, mothers, for nursing mothers. And all that. You know, until the, until the alcohol and pregnancy hysteria of the last 20 years, <laughs> that, that <laughs> mothers were always told to drink a beer to help lactation and. and <laughs> I, I can say this. My mother drank a martini every day that she was pregnant with me, and my, you know, head's not falling off. It. No. Yeah. it was like a medicine. It was a medicine for the whole family. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a tonic. A tonic. A tonic. So, so are there are there any are there any questions yes, or here. Yeah, so, please? Oh. Did you say temperance beer? Temperance beer, temperance beer is near beer by another name. Yeah. So, so, uh, so a lot of breweries in the in the prohibition era, in the pre-prohibition era, began developing what was called a temperance beer. Uh, temperance was 
Beer was always regarded as a beverage of temperance because it's low alcohol, but, but, but the temperance beer to which this question refers is basically low or non very low alcohol it's beer. It's like kissing your sister. <laughs> What's that? What's that like? <laughs> Not too satisfying. <laughs> Like our generation, like the Toledo did here. We have a question over here. Yes. Uh-oh. What happened to the alcohol from the near beer and what next You know, that's a great question about the alcohol from near beer. I think it was Seward. I, I think it was, uh, you know, it was a controlled substance. And the, uh, the Treasury Department, uh, I mean, I can't Did assure you that none of it was ever stolen, but I think it was Seward. I, you know, a license is a terrible thing to lose. And, and so, you know, anybody who had one, if you weren't a gangster, was pretty careful with it. Was it sold to pharmacies? Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Could be. Not sure. There, yeah. Oh, and I'll, oh wait. Get to your sec I'll get to your second one. Yeah. What made Stroh's Bach beer so good, and why did Stroh's quit growing? Stroh's Bach beer. You know, I can tell you the answer to the first question. What made Stroh's Bach beer so good is that it was made with all malt, caramel malt. It lasted forever. If you kept it cold, in fact, if you can find one that's been kept cold for 20, 30 years, it's still good. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. It was, awesome. It, was, it was a wonderful beer. And, and, uh, and I think the reason that it was put, put to the side was the Schlitz, you know, we bought Schlitz and basically their culture dominated us and they didn't have a Bach beer and they didn't want one and basically they said, oh, it's just a nuisance, it's in the way, got to get rid of it. And, and, I, and so that's, I think, what happened to it. Uh, what was the name of the Stroh's premium brand? Oh, Signature. Signature. Yeah, that was a great beer. Yeah, I wish, wish more people drank it. But, and, then, and what happens to Stroh next? I think... You know, it's, it's not inconceivable that somebody in the family would want to get into the beer business someday, but, I, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I enjoy drinking it. I'm happy with that for now. So, I, you know, I enjoy what I'm doing in Detroit. And it, it's, yes, back there. In the early years, yes, you'd see it. Uh, the, the, um, the, early, the style of labels, you're talking about the early labels. Yeah, I think that you know you had you know your your arts and crafts people, your lithographers and your you know the the your artisans that came from Europe and they you know there would have been a strong influence in that. Uh, well, well, what, did, what did you call well, that style? The, the the golden age of illustration. Yeah, the, the golden age of American illustration is from 1890 to 1940, and as you begin to see an evolution, the Gibson girl, the more buxom woman with the turned up hair, that is very much an American phenomenon, because you have to think about at this time, in Europe we're seeing much more of a sinuous figure, something that's moving more into the Art Nouveau, which doesn't really take hold here in the United States. So what most brewers do and what happens with most labels and most brewery products, it's very much reflective of high-end illustration that is happening in the best magazines uh, that lead to many of the great artists. Uh, who were, you know, many of the Ashcan painters, for example, made money before they were successful as illustrators. Yeah. Sadly, Norman Rockwell stuck to it and he didn't do very well. Yeah. You know, I think it's, you know how when you go into a wine, uh, the wine department, and you see 500 labels that you've never, you don't know anything about, um, and you take, you pick the one that jumps out at you, I think, I think, you know, brewers had to do the same thing. You know, there's a fair amount of background noise, and you need to do something to get noticed. So the more elaborate, the more elegant your label looked, uh, the more likely uh, you might be to get picked. And the so. audience you're trying to cultivate, yes. When they uh, brewed beer and served it in the bars and established in the background, how did they keep it close? They used ice. Ice. I mean, like if ice. Or how did they uh, well, remember, artificial refrigeration was was invented in kind of the 1870s. So that's when you see that's when you see breweries developing in the South. Uh, you uh, basically, you know, the beer styles were uh, regional beer styles evolved to respond to climate, lack of ice. 
Uh, in the north, there was a huge ice business. They shipped it south in, in uh, sawdust-filled cars. But, but artificial refrigeration was pretty widespread by the 1870s, late 1870s or 1880s. And so your typical t tavern or alehouse would have refrigerated, some sort of refrigeration system that kept the beer cold. Not necessarily as cold as we would be accustomed to drinking it today. What they did was they, they bought ice and they, and they, and they broke it up and they, and they packed it around a coil and they drew the beer through the coil and chilled it before it hit your glass. But they, you know, they might not have had it, and they had a locker that with some ice in it. But it, you know, before artificial refrigeration in in at retail. Yes. Some of the early breweries sold ice too. You know, there were breweries like Wyandotte, the Eureka Brewing Company had their own ice. They sold ice and beer and cold. It wasn't uncommon to be a brewer of ice. Yeah. Or had you have ice in a brewery and you sell cold. Especially yep. for home use. Right, right. Especially yep. for home use. Well, so, one more. One more. Ah, Peter. I thought, hey, John, I couldn't hear a lot of the questions, but I love the answers. But <laughs> I'm wondering, there was a big rivalry in the 80s or late 70s between the Coors family and the Strohs family. Was that typical of all the breweries, that the rivalry of Coors? You know, typically not. Now, by the way, that was a question. I don't want to say that was a plant, but th this is a, a good friend of mine that I went to college with whose father was on the board of Stroh's. Uh, but, uh, but, but the question was, was there a rivalry? And I think the answer was, you know, I heard an interesting thing not long ago that, that uh, Fred Meyer used to be on the board of Walmart. And, and he, was on the board, he was on the board of Walmart until, until Walmart rolled national and rolled into Michigan. Because they essentially they were in the same business, but in different parts of the country. Uh, the the Coors family and the Stroh family were always very friendly, uh, and and had a uh, you know and had a pretty good relationship until we got into each other's backyards. <laughs> so the rivalry does develop when you know there's friction, so market friction. But with that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Yes, and I thank think, you very could much. Could we could we have another Ein Prosit? Yeah, let's do it. I'm